A number of my YouTube viewers have sent me messages over the last few years asking for details on the camera equipment and so on that I use for my travel videos especially and the train ones in particular as well as questions about what do I do for editing and where do I get the frequencies used for the scanner and uh, so I just thought I'd try to nip that in the bud and uh, cover it all right now in a very brief video. First off, the cameras I use. Uh, they have changed a little bit over the years, but for the last several years my uh, primary camera for scenic photography has been this Canon model. It's the SX60HS. I think this one's obsolete, but there's something very similar available. Um, It's a really nice point and shoot with a great set of optics and very good behavior, very easy to use. And it has uh, a fairly large LCD display that uh, flips out and can be twisted around in different directions. Uh, so if I have to hold it up over my head or at some unusual angle, for example, I can still see what the video is all about as I'm framing it. Uh, so this is one that's used for a lot of the train videos. My other main camera, and sometimes the only one I take with me on trips, uh, will be this other Canon model. This one's a, a, a pocketable camera. Uh, it's also a point and shoot. This is the model PowerShot SX610HS and it's seen a lot of use. I actually buy several of these things. I have several of them. I'm shooting this video with another one of them and uh, even though it's a discontinued model I really like it and uh, as they turn up occasionally on Amazon and other places somebody still has new ones to sell I'll scarf up another one uh, because I use them in my shop, I use them for documenting projects outside and they eventually get banged up or dirty or something happens to them so I degrade them. You'll notice how I put these little labels on them like this is the one that's in the best condition right now. I'm shooting this video with the one that used to be the best and I've downgraded it to good which means it still takes perfectly good pictures, but it's getting more banged up, and I don't rely on it as my primary uh, pocket camera. Anyway, so that covers the two uh, models of camera I use for everything, and there's a good chance if you've watched my train videos, two-thirds of the video is taken with one of these, and the other third is taken with the bigger one. Other stuff I take along related to the camera is always a microfiber lens wipe and I always take several of these little packs uh, the pre-moistened lens wipe they won't scratch the lenses and that's good if you've got some gunk that got on the lens and you need to wipe it off especially if a solvent's involved because this has either alcohol or ammonia in it kinda like using a little Windex um, and then the other thing that's really great to have is one of these products. Nikon makes these in several models. I find these invaluable to carry with me. And if I'm going in any place that I think is going to be especially messy, like the time I took the steam train in Scotland and I had my head hanging out the window and in the, uh, the steam plume that was coming back with all the ash in it and everything, there's more than just water coming back there and uh, some abrasives. Uh, I don't want to just start rubbing on it with a, a rag. So these things have a nice little soft bristle whisk brush that retracts. Uh, and the other side has this sort of microfiber curved pad which basically you just kind of breathe on the lens of the camera to get it moist and then slowly go in an orbital, orbital fashion around the lens and uh, it does a really good job of cleaning them up. Now for the cameras, um, 
my uh, two cameras that I use take two different types of batteries so I bring the chargers for uh, the two types along with me and I'm always charging them at night and any opportunity that I can to have the ones I'm not currently using in the cameras being charged and uh, I also carry at least two spare batteries of each type with me so I can have one in the camera one charging and a third that's been charged or if I'm going to be away from the train or my car or whatever for an extended period perhaps doing one of my walkthroughs of a museum where I'm doing a lot of shooting depleting batteries then I've got three batteries I can burn through uh, shooting the video before I run out of battery so that's my recommendation is always have three batteries for each camera as it's worth the investment um, when, I, when I'm able to, I like to get the models of charger that have the little cord on them. Um, some of them have a flip-out plug here. The reason I like the corded models is that it's easier to plug several of them into outlet strips. Because otherwise they're too big and it blocks adjacent uh, outlets on the outlet strip. Now, since I take a lot of videos, I have a lot of SD cards. This is the uh, wallet I used to use. It's a, another Canon product. It's a nice leatherette wallet, quite durable, and it has pockets for eight SD cards. And I would stick them in right side up like this uh, when they're ready to be used. And uh, then when I've used them, besides putting the lock on them, the little sliding lock each SD card has, I would flip them over and put them in the uh, slots here upside down so I would know at a glance that that's a used card and that I there's no point in pulling it out to reuse it. Um, anytime I would leave I would always keep these with me in a pocket uh, that way if somebody busts in or steals something from a car, a hotel room, a train, uh, wherever you haven't lost all your pictures they're always on your person and I suppose if you got mugged or something this wouldn't be terribly valuable to a thief. Now since I'm using uh, a lot more video these days I found that that old holster was not up to scratch anymore. It couldn't hold enough. <clears throat> so I've got this thing from Memory Market. This holds a lot more cards than the other one did in something only slightly thicker and about the same otherwise so you can get a lot of cards in here so and it also has a lanyard to help hold it on and again I just carry it around in my pocket it never leaves my body during the whole trip then people ask me about the scanner I use and uh, this is the one that's in all of my videos. It's the only one I've used during the time I've been taking videos. This is a Uniden model. Radio Shack used to sell the same model under their name. This one seems to have been branded with NASCAR, but there's nothing NASCAR about it. Uh, and I think they sold this model without the NASCAR emblem. I think this is about a $60 or $70 scanner. It's well built. It works well. No, Nothing too fancy, but it's small. And reliable. Uh, now I don't use it with its own control panel because that I have some trouble remembering how to use on my trips. Um, so I do program it uh, using a piece of software I bought that goes with it and it connects up with a uh, USB to proprietary cable that plugs into the scanner and then uh, the software that goes with that allows me to manage all the setup and loading of frequencies and other uh, characteristics from the convenience of my personal computer instead of doing this. However, um, I do always carry a uh, cheat sheet I made up of the most common things I'm likely to have to do uh, in a way that I can make sense of it and still have it in a small space. And I just laminated it and uh, carry it around um, and I always bring the uh, AC power supply 
even though it would run quite a long time on a set of double A's, and I do bring the double A's with me along with one or two spare pairs in case I have to use it without being plugged in, but when it's on the train at least, I have this plugged in all the time to save batteries. And since the train cars, at least the sleeper cars that I usually stay in uh, on Amtrak, have AC power, that's easy as long as I bring my outlet strip so I can plug multiple things in. Here's the uh, website I use to get the frequencies for each Amtrak route. OnTrackOnline.com. Let's see if I can move the cursor. And you have to remember to put the hyphens in between the on, the track, the on, and the line. And right over here on the left, it says Amtrak or AMTK frequencies. And uh, you just select the route. You know, I want to do the, uh, the crescent or something, and it'll pop up and show you all the frequencies that are used which you can then plug into the uh, scanner. Now I have a separate YouTube video on this process. I go into more detail, so I'm not going to go into detail here. But this is where the frequencies come from. People ask about the GPS I use. Now a lot of people are using their phones for GPS's these days, and that's fine, but I don't use them as such on my trips because I'm often using my smartphone for some other purpose, uh, listening to an audiobook if I'm driving, uh, or making phone calls or looking up things on the web to do a little research about places or uh, attractions I'm going past on trains, for example, and I can't be looking at two different things on a single screen. So I find it convenient to just have an automotive GPS on the window of the train at all times and then use my phone for other stuff. So, uh, you know, this is Garmin's website. I use the Garmin stuff. I don't honestly know how their website works here. It's kind of squirrely. But I've selected, you know, they say there's like one hit for a five inch screen or a five and a half inch screen and traffic reporting, one model. It seems like they've got one model. They used to have a ton of models. Um, so, um, you know, it looks like a basic automotive GPS, and uh, it's the Drive Smart 55, and it looks like they have, oh, I guess they do have some different models. There's the uh, Drive Assist 51. I don't need all that stuff, but um, they do have different models, at least three models. So you can still buy these things. They're probably going to run you in the uh, you know two to three hundred dollar range depending on features at least that's list price so you probably get it cheaper but I still recommend taking a true automotive GPS along for train trips in particular and I also recommend using a real camera not what some people in the younger generation in particular like to use their smartphones for everything and that's just not smart I'm sorry it isn't uh, it doesn't allow any redundancy, not, it doesn't have any of the features that the proper units have. It's always going to be sort of half-assed. So if you want to take good pictures or videos, you should use a real camera. If you want to do real navigation and still be able to use your phone for something else, you should use a dedicated unit. Um, that's all I'm going to say about that. Okay, and uh, although it's not as specific as scanners and cameras and GPS's. Um, this is the way I edit my videos together. This is a fairly low-end application by Serif. Uh, it's a software company in England. I use a lot of their other products such as their page layout or desktop publishing software and their photo editing software and some other things which I think are all very competitive and at least as good as the competition. Unfortunately, Serif, about a year or so ago, maybe a couple years ago, has decided they don't want to make products anymore for the, the amateur or home user. They want to 
cater to the professional, so they've discontinued all their low-end products that may cost one or two hundred dollars, and now they're selling software and developing software that's much more capable and costs a lot more. And it's possible at some point I may look at that software, but for the meantime I'm still using their older software suite. Anyway, for their video editing program, they call it Movie Plus, and I've been using this for a long time. I used to use uh, Sony's uh, programming suite uh, until I had problems with it once where it got twitchy and wouldn't deal with the codecs I was getting from mainstream cameras and their tech support had failed me and in desperation I reached out to Serif and bought their um, Movie Plus application which has served me very well easy to use for the most part it works perfectly pretty intuitive to use so that's what I use and I keep using it even though it's no longer produced okay here we are in uh, Movie Plus it's very typical of other editing programs for video I have over on the left and these windows can all be moved around and frames can be moved around this is the way I like them I've got my uh, Explorer application here on the left you can see uh, over in this area and the videos that I've taken uh, are all here usually I have hundreds of them from a, a train trip for example in this case I'm actually editing the video that I'm making so the uh, uh, video I took with one camera has been loaded into uh, the computer so it's accessible to me here and then I'm shooting additional video which I'll have to also load in before I can finish this project anyway I can see all the videos and uh, access them here and here's a preview screen with basic uh, controls under the preview screen um, for play and stop and skip ahead and so on and over on the right is a properties pane where if I'm working on an audio track or a video track or a still photo it'll prop up the pop pop up the properties of that thing and I can do some editing if the video or the picture is too dark I can lighten it and I can crop and do all sorts of things if I'm working on text I can edit the characteristics of the text and then down here is the so-called timeline uh, in its basic form it has an overlay track which is for things like putting video or text captions then the main video track is here uh, and then there's the audio track and then there's a music track if I have some background music and they are all mixed together uh, you can add additional tracks now I don't have a very big monitor here and I only have one monitor so it gets a little cumbersome when I add more tracks but I do do it on some uh, some instances uh, and I should mention at this point that when I'm using multiple cameras especially for travel videos I make a point of synchronizing their clocks uh, you know within a few seconds of each other uh, just before starting the trip because sometimes I'll be for example if I'm in a train I'll be shooting with one camera but then maybe I go to lunch or something and I still I don't want to carry the big camera around with me for that uh, and I have my little pocket camera always in my pocket and I go somewhere and there's some video I want to take I'll take that so sometimes the video segments get scrambled between the two cameras and also on a, a variety of SD cards by the time the trip or the project is done and without a synchronized timestamp on them it can be pretty difficult to uh, to tell which order they go in now here's a interesting tidbit that still pictures have the timestamp embedded in their metadata where videos do not uh, at least on the ones I've looked at and certainly not the cameras I have so the the videos don't really tell you when they were taken so I have a little trick that I use when I'm juggling cameras like that if I haven't just taken another video with the same camera in my hand 
I always start out by taking a still photo of the same subject and immediately start taking video. So what I end up with, interspersed with my videos, are still photos showing the same image as the beginning of the of the uh, video that follows and the still photo has the timestamp so I can use that for time synchronization. Anyway, it's just a, a little trick that I've figured out. Other people may have a different solution to the problem. Anyway, so this is again very typical. I'm going to start here by putting in a uh, text clip and uh, I'm going to select my uh, my title there. Actually, I think I'm going to go with uh, 36 point and let's see if I can zoom in a little bit. I'm going to call it by request. Did I type that correctly? Yes. How do you like that? By request, how I shoot and edit my YouTube videos. That should work. So I just make sure I drag that down here to the beginning of my timeline. And I'm going to zoom back out. And then I'm going to start with uh, my first video. And I'm going to go in here and on the timeline I'm going to drag it so it slightly overlaps so I get a fade from the introductory card to the video. And then I'm going to play it. A number of my YouTube viewers have sent me messages over the last few years asking for details on the camera equipment and so on that I use for my travel videos especially and the train ones in particular as well as so you get the idea and if I go through here and I find something that I don't want or I coughed or I paused or something or it's just out of focus or something where I can't use it this uh, allows me to crop it you know I've put my cursor here and I can click the uh, scissors or split and I don't know if you can see it there but it's now two separate video clips and I can drag this one away I can put something else in it I can make another cut over here cut that out delete the middle part and then drag the remainder over to intersect with the first part it's really flexible and in this case I decided I didn't really want to take it apart nor did I want to split it these video editors are almost universally what's called non-destructive which means that just because you deleted something or cut something or split something or changed the brightness on something or put text over it the actual original video is not changed only its representation here in the software has changed so it is never hurting the original in any way and if you totally booger things up, you can still go back and just say, well, I really ruined that. I'm just going to delete it, reload the original represent or the representation of the original and re-edit it. So that's always nice. Um, anyway, so, you know, I come over here and I say, well, that's the part where I'm talking about my cameras. I can scroll through the timeline down here. Okay, I'm finished talking about the cameras. And now I want to talk about, you know, here's the video. I'm dragging it in here on the lens wipes that I use with the cameras. So I drag that in there, make a slight overlap, and you have to check the transition. The other third is taken with the bigger one. Other stuff I take along related to the camera is so there's a, a segue right there. Lens wipe. And I just put them all together that way. And, uh, you know, maybe at this point I realized I forgot to say something in the video. So I'll click over here and put in a text clip. Select my 36 
point again, I'm using that universally on this video, and I'll say, I forgot to mention blah, 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 and put some extra information up here and position it on the screen in some place that is hopefully not going to detract from the subject of the video and drop it there. So now when I, uh, this black blotch here is my video overlay, so I'm going to drag it up into the overlay track area. Uh, it treats it a little different if I do it here or here. So, so I'll come so over here. Covers the two. And now the text uh, pops up here. Camera I use for everything until there's a good the clip goes away on the timeline. Two thirds of the videos. So uh, basically, that's how the video is edited. And then finally, um, when I'm done with it, I'll go to export. And an export drop down pops up here, and I'll select I want to do a file. And then I'll go over here and say, Yeah, I want an MP4 style or format video. And I'll go down here and select that I want NTSC and widescreen and, you know, 1080p or whatever I want to do. I'll select the render quality and I'll click finish and it'll go away and depending on the length of the video it may take hours to render it which is an interesting process I'll address here briefly even though it's not really the subject of the video I mentioned that the software never alters the original videos that I took and everything I'm doing here if I add something if I cut out a section it records in the uh, video editing file that I'm creating here. Uh, basically you get two files out of this process. You get the video editing file which this software creates and that's just a record of all the edits I made. And then you get the resulting file that it renders which is the one that goes up on YouTube. That's the actual video file. Uh, so in the actual editing file that I'm creating while I'm making this a video all it's doing is recording and it says a video with such and such a name is positioned to start at exactly you know this point in time and when it gets to this point in time a piece of it's cut out and then it's going to resume with a video of a different name starting at such and such a point and oh by the way they overlap by three seconds so fade from one to the other and when you do the rendering then it plays that file back and it just looks at everything that was recorded during the editing process and then it does it and crunches the numbers in software, manipulates all the pixels and so on until it gets the resulting video file. Uh, so anyway, that's the basic process and I hope the people who asked me to do this are satisfied by this. Thanks for watching.